So I have some things that the Lord wants me to share with you all. And a lot of times when the Lord gives me these morning messages to give to people, they're not always the easiest topics to start discussing. And I'm going to talk about my dream that I had. It was a very quick dream on October the 27th. Basically in a dream, I was making a video for YouTube and I was teaching about what happens when Jesus comes back. And then I saw the words, seven signs that God is about to be here. And it was like the number seven. It wasn't the word seven. So seven signs that God is about to be here. And then I also remember seeing the words, God reconciles. This was like a, a warning dream. And I knew that the Lord wanted me to talk about this for a while because he's been laying this on me for about a month. And all week long, God just keeps on giving me these dreams about me teaching, about me preaching, and telling you all what's going to happen when Jesus returns. So first, I'm going to talk about what happens when Jesus comes. Then I'm going to talk about the seven signs that God is about to be here. And I didn't even know that there were seven signs, y'all. Like, I knew that there were signs to look for when Jesus returns, but... The number seven, like God has been laying seven on me all week long, even through other dreams. He's been telling me about the number seven and number seven. So I looked into the number seven and it's mentioned like all throughout the Bible. Like there are several scriptures that talk about seven, like on the seventh day back in Genesis, that's when God rested. There are seven trumpets, seven bowls of wrath in Revelation, seven churches. And what I found was, it means like completeness and fullness. Basically, it's going to be done. So first, I'm going to talk about what happens when Jesus comes, the seven signs that God is about to be here, and then God reconciles. Because this is what the Holy Spirit, you know, has given me to give to you all. And I've been having this urgency and this warning inside of me for a very long time to start letting you all know like what's going to happen because a lot of people really don't know what it's going to be like when Jesus comes back. People are going to be clueless because there's going to be people that are left behind and there's going to be people that's going to get caught up and not everybody is going to make it. So first I'm going to pray before I start talking about this. Thank you father for downloading this information to me, Lord. I pray that you use me, Lord. Let this speak to whoever you wanted to speak to. I'm a vessel for you, Father. Let the other people on the other end be receptive to what it is that you're trying to say. And I just pray, Lord, that this awakens the sleeping sons and daughters of you, Father, to come back to you before it's too late. In Jesus' name. So I'm going to start off in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. And I have a lot of notes that I'm going to be reading off of. For the Lord himself shall ascend down from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That means that God is going to come down from heaven. There's going to be a loud trumpet. Everybody's going to hear it. And the dead that are in the graves, they're going to come up first. So they're going to get to go up in the sky first with Jesus in the air. And it's going to be the dead that were in Christ. And then verse 17 says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Us that are in Christ, that are still alive on earth, we'll get to go up in the clouds and we'll get to meet the Lord in the air. So now you have these people. You have these people in heaven, and then you have these people that are left on earth. And I need to talk about what's going to happen to the people that are in heaven and what's going to happen to the people that are on earth. So the people in heaven are going to be judged. And I'm going to read 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he have done, whether it be good or bad. So again, the people in heaven, 
we're all going to get judged. Everything that we've ever done, good or bad, we're going to either gain rewards for it or we're going to lose rewards for it because in heaven, there are a lot of rewards for us and they're up there waiting for us. But some people are going to lose rewards for not obeying what the Lord told them to do while they were here on earth. And then others will gain rewards. Also in Matthew 25, I'm not going to read it, but there's a parable of the 10 bridesmaids. And then you can also read Revelations 19, 5 through 10 that talks about the marriage supper with the lamb. Now for the people that get left behind, that are still going to be here on the earth, there's going to be a seven year tribulation period. A lot of believers argue the coming of Jesus is going to come, the rapture is going to come before the seven year tribulation. Some argue that it's going to come in the middle of it. And some say it's going to come at the end. However you want to view it, it's on you. But everyone agrees that Jesus will be returning to get his church to go up in the clouds. God's judgment and wrath will be poured out. And there will be a seven-year tribulation period. It starts when the Antichrist signs a seven-year covenant with Israel. So that's going to be an indicator that the tribulation period is beginning. I'm going to read Daniel 9, 27 in the NLT. The ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of seven. But after half his time, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. And as a climax to all his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object that causes desecration until the fate decreed for this defiler is finally poured out on him. So the Antichrist is going to have this image that he's going to make people bow down and worship to. He's going to be the false messiah. He's not going to be the real Jesus, the real messiah. He's the false messiah, the Antichrist, the beast. Now throughout the tribulation period, God's judgment is going to be poured out on the earth and God's wrath is going to be poured out on the earth. And in Revelations 8 through 9, it talks about the trumpet judgments. And in 16, it starts talking about the bowl judgments, the seven bowls of God's wrath. So I really encourage you all to dig into the book of Revelations so that you can get a better understanding because I'm not going to go in and read scripture for scripture. I'm just going to try to hit on some key points. Now, for the unbelievers, they're going to be given an option to bow down and worship the Antichrist and receive the mark of the beast. And I'm going to read Revelation 13, 16 through 18 in the NLT. He required everyone small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead. And no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. Wisdom is needed here. Let the one with understanding solve the meaning of the number of the beast, for it is a number of a man. His number is 666. So the mark is going to be evident. There's not going to be a doubt in anyone's mind. You're going to go into this knowing that this is the mark of the beast. And it's going to be a mark that's on the outside of the body. It's going to be either on the right hand or it's going to be on your forehead. People are not going to second guess and say, oh, is this the mark of the beast? You know, is it this? Is it that? No, you're going to know that this is the mark. But the gospel will still be preached by 144,000 Jewish believers. They're going to be protected by God and they're going to have a mark on their forehead as well with God's name on it. And they're going to be the ones that are out in the world during the seven year period. They're going to be telling people to repent, come to Jesus. They're going to be preaching the gospel. So the people that are left here, they now have the option to receive the mark of the beast, bow down to the, the Antichrist. Or they can wake up and follow Jesus. And if you want to read about the 144,000, it's in Revelations chapter 14. So during the seven years, God's judgment and God's wrath is going to be poured out. And I want to go over the seven bowls of wrath from God. The first bowl is in Revelation 16, 1 through 2. And it talks about sores on all the followers of the Antichrist. There's going to be sores all over their body. The second bowl in verse 3 all of the sea is going to be turned to blood and it's going to kill everything in the sea. The third bowl talks about all the fresh water turning to blood. And that's going to be in Revelation 16, 4 through 7. And then the fourth bowl in Revelations 8 through 9, it says that people are going to be scorched by intense 
sunshine. So it's going to be so hot to the point that people are going to be getting burned. The fifth bowl in Revelations 16, 10 through 11, it says it's going to be complete darkness over those who worship the Antichrist. It's going to be so dark that you can't even see if you put your hand in front of your face. That's how dark it's going to be here on earth. The sixth bowl is in Revelation 16, 12 through 15. The Euphrates River is going to dry up. And that's when the Battle of Armageddon is going to start. And then the seventh bowl is in Revelation 16, 17 through 21. There's going to be great earthquakes. Babylon is going to get destroyed. There's going to be a lot of hailstorms. And the Bible even says in Revelation that it's going to be so bad that people are going to try to commit suicide and they're not going to die. Like that's how bad it's going to be. So I'm going to read Revelations 14, verse 9 through 11 in the King James Version. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and, who, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. These people that got the, the 666 on their right hand or their forehead who got the mark of the beast and who are worshiping the Antichrist, this idol, they are going to be tormented with fire and brimstone. And they're going to be tormented in the presence of angels and Jesus because he's the lamb. And then it also says that they're not going to have any rest day or night. So for the people who don't have the mark, they're still going to suffer because you're not going to be able to buy or sell for one. And then secondly, they have to be here to experience God judging the earth. Now, at the end of the tribulation, the Antichrist is going to attack Jerusalem. And that's going to be called the Battle of Armageddon. That's when Jesus is going to be in that battle. And I'm going to read Revelation 16, 16 in the NLT. And the demonic spirits gathered all the rulers and their armies to a place with the Hebrew name Armageddon. And Revelation 9, 11, it says, And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he doeth judge and make war. And then in Revelation 19, verse 14, it says that we're going to be with him. The ones that are in heaven with him. It says, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon the white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. So we're actually going to come back down and be in this battle of Armageddon. We're going to ride white horses with Jesus and we're going to have on white linen. Then in Revelations 20, verse 1 through 3, in the King James, I'm going to read, um, because this is after Jesus defeats Satan, because you know we win at the end. Jesus will cast Satan and his armies into the lake of fire for 1,000 years, and he will rule an earthly kingdom for, those, for this 1,000-year period. And then at the end of this 1,000-year period, Satan is going to get released. He's going to get defeated again. And then he's going to get cast into the lake of fire, which the Bible calls the second death. And I want to read Revelations 20, verse 10 in the King James Version. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So then after that, the people that's left on the earth get judged, the believers and the unbelievers. And I need to read Revelations 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So the people that follow Christ during the seventh year tribulation period, they're going to get seated in front of Jesus again, and they're going to be judged in front of the throne of God, and they are going to reign with Christ for a thousand years.
Now for the unbelievers, I need to read Revelations 20 verse 12 through 15. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were open. And an other book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was, found, was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Then the last thing that's going to happen is that we're going to receive a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. And it talks about it in Revelations 21, verse 1 through 4, which I'm about to read. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city of Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed for the former things are passed away. In the new heaven and the new earth, there's not going to be any more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, and this is going to be a place for eternity. Satan is upset right now because he's being exposed. And I cast down spiritual wickedness in high places and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And no satanic force by any means shall come against or hinder this video in the name of Jesus. So I'm going to talk about the seven signs that Jesus is about to return. And all of these signs are in Matthew 24. But before I start going through the seven signs, I want to read Matthew 16:3. Jesus says, you know how to interpret the weather signs in the sky, but you don't know how to interpret the signs of the times. So what Jesus is saying is, when you go outside, you can look up at the sky and you know that it's going to be a rainy day if you see clouds. You know it may be a hot day if you feel that it's humid outside. You need to be able to look at the signs going on in the earth and see that I'm about to return. So the first sign is that there's going to be a lot of deception going on. People are going to be deceived. And I'm going to read Matthew 24, verses 4, 5, 11, and 24. I'm going to start off with verse 3, because Jesus is with his disciples, and they're asking him, how do we know that you're about to return to the earth? And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Then verse 11 says, And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. Then verse 24, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Basically, we need to make sure that we're putting our trust in God. Who are you putting your trust in? Are you trusting your friends? Are you trusting social media? Are you trusting the government? Are you trusting your church? It says in Proverbs 3, verse 5 through 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not to thine own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. He will direct your paths. If you trust the Lord, if you have a personal, intimate relationship with God, it is going to be very difficult for anyone to come in and deceive you. So I encourage you all, get into an intimate relationship with the Lord. Seek him. Seek his face. Seek him diligently. Seek him daily. When you do these things, all outside voices will start to shut down and you're going to start to hear his voice only. So the stranger of deception will not apply to you because you know what thus saith the Lord is. You know what the word of God says about every situation, about every circumstance in your life, about everything. The second sign is wars. And I'm going to read verses six through seven. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. 
See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. The Bible talks about birth pains as far as looking at the signs in the earth. So we know that we've always seen wars, but we need to be looking at the frequency. When a woman has birth, when she's about to go into birth and she has those labor pains, they're called contractions. So we look at how intense those contractions in the earth are. How frequent are we starting to see wars, which ties into number three. The third sign is famines, pestilence, and earthquakes, which is in verse seven. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. So there has been an increase in famines, pestilences, earthquakes, in various places throughout the world. Number four is persecution. Christians are going to be persecuted. And I'm going to read Matthew verses 9 and 10. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. A lot of other countries are experiencing this persecution. I live in the U.S. We're not experiencing this persecution, but eventually it's probably going to come to the United States as well. But we can see in China that they're having church underground. In Afghanistan, they're getting martyred if they're a Christian. So persecution is an indicator as well. Number five is there's going to be a lot of sin and no love. Sin is going to be running rampant and there's going to be no loving people. And I'm going to read verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And I also want to read 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 in the NLT version. Because it talks about some of the dangers in the last days. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days, there will be very difficult times for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that can make them godly. Stay away from people like that. Number six is the gospel is going to be preached over all the world. And it talks about it in verse 14. And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all of the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. And then number seven is pay attention to Israel. I'm going to read a parable in verses 32 through 34. Now learn a parable of the fig tree when his branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves. You know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And then Jesus says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. So when I saw the words, God reconciles, I was led to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18 through 21. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. What I'm receiving from the Holy Spirit is that there is still time to be reconciled back to Jesus. He is using me to let you all know, come back to Christ. Right now we are living under a time of grace so when you sin, you can ask for forgiveness and God will forgive you. As long as you're genuinely repentful for your sins and you're trying to seek the Lord. But there is a time coming very, very soon that all that is going to be over with. Because God has to come in and judge the wickedness that is going on in the earth. There's still a chance for you to give your life to Christ. Why would you want to wait and experience all of these terrible things that are about to go on in the earth. 
this is a warning message from the Lord. God is merciful. So he gives everyone free will to do what it is that they want to do. He doesn't make you follow him. He gives us free choice. It's our choice if we want to follow after life or if we want to follow after death. It's our choice if we want to follow after the world's ways or we want to follow after God's ways. He is hoping that you're going to make the right choice and follow after his ways, but he has to make the gospel known to everyone so that everyone is clear about what Jesus did. Jesus got spit on, he got whooped, he got crucified. He was so nervous that he sweated blood. Blood actually came out of his pores as he prayed to God. So I'm saying all of this to say that Jesus did all of this for you. He did this for me, he did this for you, he did it for all of us so that we don't have to suffer and experience the wrath of God. He loved us that much that he took his own life so that we could live. People think that Jesus is the sweet, loving person, and he is, but God is going to have to judge the earth. And if you read Revelations, it says that he will wipe away every tear. There's going to be no more sorrow. There's going to be no more death. And before it gets to that point, Jesus is coming back with the whole army to judge this earth. There is going to be a war that's going to go on in this earth. And it's going to be a great day for those who know the Lord but it's about to be hell on earth if you don't know who he is. So if you want a relationship with God, you want to get to know Jesus, you want to secure your home in heaven, and you're either tired of running away from God or you just don't know him and you want to get to know him better, all you have to do is say, Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins, known and unknown wash me cleanse me set me free fill me with the holy spirit and give me the evidence of speaking in tongues in jesus name and one of the things that i do personally is i make it a daily habit to say lord i give you my life as a living sacrifice my eyes are yours my ears are yours my mouth is yours my feet are yours i'll say what you want me to say i'll go wherever you want me to go take my life and do something with it make me usable for you i want a relationship with you just like how you had a relationship with abraham i want a relationship with you just how you spoke to moses and noah and when you pray those type of prayers those prayers are powerful when you die to your flesh daily and ask the holy spirit to lead you and guide you you want to die to the flesh you want to walk in the spirit let be led by the spirit something happens because god is going to start to use you the Bible says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. When he sees that you're seeking him diligently, when you're seeking his face with a pure heart and you're living righteous and trying to stay holy, he is going to turn your life around. So I love you all and you all be blessed in Jesus name. I never felt this way about nobody. I want to know everything there is to know about you. At first I didn't know how to go about it. Now I go to war about you. I go to war about it. We go to war.